Bigfoot or Big Hoax? You decide. Join me, Jack Faust, on Town Hall tonight at 6 on KATU Channel 2. You believe? Tonight on Town Hall, a noted anthropologist says a recent sighting near Spokane offers the most persuasive proof yet that Bigfoot exists. Watch as believers take on the skeptics who say Bigfoot is a big hoax. Searching for Bigfoot, coming up next. And now, your moderator, Jack Faust. Hi. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the abominable snowman, call him or her whatever you want. It's a controversy as old as the hills in which they're sighted and as fresh as the winds have been blowing the last couple days because in recent weeks, more sightings. The controversy continues. Is this real? Is this imagination? Is this trickery? What is Bigfoot? That's Town Hall tonight. In our hot seats, we have from my left to my right, four special guests. We have Caleb Burns, who is a clinical psychologist here in Portland. We have Mike Dennett, who is the president of what is called the Society for Sensible Explanations, a skeptic. These two gentlemen are skeptic. Paired off with them are two who are not skeptics. We have Grover Krantz. He is a professor of anthropology at Washington State University and an author of a good-selling book, on the Bigfoot controversy. Next to him is Jim Hukin, who is a wildlife biologist, also a believer in Bigfoot. Now, what does a Bigfoot look like? Uh, one view of it we're going to give our audience to start off with was supplied to us by uh, two of our alert viewers who have photos of us that they have sent in for us. And there our audience sees, and here we see there's a photo sent to us uh, from an alleged sighting. And I believe we have another picture there. Yes, and there we have another picture. Now, let's go from the photographs uh, to the eyewitnesses. And I'm going to ask here, who here in this audience has seen Bigfoot? You, sir, identify yourself. My name's Gary Weiler. I was hunting elk in about 1982 with some family and some friends. It was Whereabouts? Up in, out of Milton Free Water area, mm -hmm. the, the Blue Mountain Range. The Blue Mountains. Mm -hmm. um, we were uh, just getting done hunting it was just starting to get dark we were at the, camped at the end of a meadow we were all standing there and we noticed an object come out of the far end of the meadow came straight at us and then paralleled us we figured maybe it saw the fire or something how far away 200 yards it would just began to snow it was plenty light out we could see it was up on two hind legs walking uh, we figured it wasn't no bear because a bear usually does not walk on his hind legs no 100 yards, 150 yards, usually only under attack or something like that, they'll get up on their legs. But uh, they walked through the parallel to us to the edge of the woods and uh, then stopped, fiddled around. I don't know what it was doing, just standing there, and then that was the end of it. We didn't want to go after it. How big would you say? Well, to get an idea, at first, we saw when we saw it come out, we thought it was an elk. An elk, elk is a pretty massive animal, mm -hmm. you know, and. Uh, then when we realized it wasn't on four legs, it was up on two, we got a little more curious. We had scopes. We tried to see, you know, better. We couldn't tell no hair color or anything. We knew it was dark, blackish color. And uh, it was rather big, you know, probably nine, ten feet tall. What was it walking on? Snow. Did it leave tracks? We did not go up there to look. <laughs> well, we weren't interested, you know. I like say, you know, brave white hunters, you know, but we didn't... We didn't want to go look. <laughs> Who else? <coughs> Other sightings. Right there, you, sir. Identify uh, yeah. yourself, please. Uh, yeah, my name is John Parsons. I belong to the Western Bigfoot Society. I uh, recently joined. Uh, I had a sighting in 1979, the end of October. Whereabouts? It was in uh, Oregon Coast, Coal Mountain Road, and I was uh, deer hunting up there. It was the middle of the night, <coughs> uh, about 2 o'clock. Uh, now, what, what kind of terrain is this? Tell our viewers. Are we No, kind of we're talking about just dense forest. Uh huh, dense area. forest. Right, but it was, uh, I was parked with a friend of mine in his camper, uh -huh. and I just got out to use the great outdoor restroom at 2 o'clock in the morning, and it was a full moon. I swung the camper door open. There it was about uh, 30 feet behind me, and right in front of me, just staring at me. He just, it was up an overgrown road. It must have come up an overgrown road to investigate. I was curious, maybe the camper was there, and 
I startled it, and it startled the living heck out of me. <laughs> and I reached around. I, I looked at it for about 30 seconds. I reached around and grabbed a flashlight. At flash what range? Uh, it was about 30 feet from me. 30 feet? About 30 feet, yeah. It was just, it just, there was an overgrown road. The moon was shining from behind it, and it was just mm -hmm. massive, just blocked out the whole road. I would say it just had, had real wide shoulders, narrow hips, and it looked to me, uh, if I could summarize this, more like just like a gorilla with extended legs, and it had real long arms. The arms were way down below its knees. It was hanging below its knees. It was real massive, real muscular. How tall? Uh, well, we, I figured out uh, from this little branch that its head was rubbing on uh, that I measured it was seven feet eight inches in height, and I would say it's probably eight or nine hundred pounds. So it left some tracks, some fourteen-inch tracks. What'd you do about the tracks? I didn't do anything with the tracks. I was out hunting, so I, I wasn't. Mean, did you bring some back to take a look? No, at them I didn't. Uh, I didn't do anything. I had other hunters look mm -hmm. at the tracks. Yes, I did have other hunters look at them, mm -hmm. and the only explanation was look down, look at the tracks. Says, "Don't bother me. I've seen just hundreds of these tracks out here in this in this area, and they just." Kind of shrugged it off, never paid any attention Let's to it. Let's put at the all. tail in your story. Having met Bigfoot, how did you part company? Well, it took off. Mm -hmm. Basically, it trudged through the brush. It, it did a uh, left hand turn and, and, and thrashed through the brush and took off. Has anybody here seen, uh, who, who might say here would feel, I have had a good close view in daylight? Is there somebody here who would say that? I, a good close view in the daylight? Would you introduce yourself, sir? I'm Ernest Fritz, and this took place in the very northwest corner of Montana, heavily wooded area for many miles. I was standing in a little open field on my way to go fishing at a favorite lake when suddenly a deer came rushing out of the woods and started into the open meadow, very frightened. About at that time, there was a terrible roaring <coughs> and a a scream that ended up a blood-curdling scream. And I sank down into the grass to see what might be going on. I was a little afraid. Out of the woods bounded this creature, or whatever you would want to call it, a huge thing, probably close to eight foot tall, dark brown fur, long arms, and walking upright on two very sturdy-looking legs. Now, how far were you at this I was this about site? 100 feet from there. 100 yes. feet? Now, the deer became paralyzed at the screech of the animal. What did it sound like? What kind of a screech was it? Well, I'd hate to try it. Here. Try it. <laughs> I mean, what are we talking about? Are we talking about a high-pitched <laughs> roar? <laughs> OK. OK. <laughs> Only it was a lot louder. All right. That wasn't too and bad. More blood curdling. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the, the deer just became paralyzed. and this thing, this animal, in about four good long strides, grabbed the deer by the head, lifted it up bodily without any problem at all, and sank its teeth into its throat. The deer quit struggling in a few minutes, and then the animal looked right, left, right, left, to see if anything would challenge it to its kill. Seeing no problem, I, I I think I had sunk down into the dirt a foot <laughs> trying to keep out of sight. If I had tried to take a picture of it, even if I had a camera, I, could, I, I wouldn't have done it. The click of the camera could have alerted it. If I'd have raised up, any movement would have alerted it, and I wouldn't be here. But anyway, making sure that nothing seemed to be challenging it, it grabbed the deer around the nose with a big, not a paw, but a hand, took the deer, slung it over its shoulder, and disappeared into the woods. Wow. Now, I was close enough to see that the, the facial features was, I would say, half human and half animal, just a, a, a sort of a cross in there. Now, what it did with the deer, I don't know. Did it walk, and all the time it's walking it, on its hind legs? Always, right? and very agile for its size. Very agile, very quick, <laughs> And fast. how tall do you think? Very close to eight feet, at least, mm -hmm. between seven and eight, but that's, closer to eight. matches the measurement uh, or the estimate we just heard here. Yes, I would, yes. All right, there are three sightings, and, I, and I'm going to turn to you, uh, Jimmy, who can just ask you, uh, you're on one of our hot seats, uh, what other evidence, is there any evidence, tangible evidence, that goes beyond these anecdotes, these, these eyewitness reports? Well, uh, I've been spending about 20 years or so in the field ch checking out for something like that. And uh, I've found evidence where they have been uh, grubbing around like a bear, tearing up logs and stumps and 
and uh, rolling over rocks. And, uh, and it's hard to tell the evidence from a bear's evidence. You know, it's really difficult because they don't leave much sign. They hardly leave any tracks. And uh, when you find a disturbed uh, stump or a log or whatever, you have to look for a claw march to determine whether a bear did it or not. If there's now, no Jim, claw you, marks, you brought us a couple of photos that I think uh, you, you consider to be evidence. Uh, do you want to uh, tell our viewers? There we go. There's one up on the screen there. Can you tell our viewers what that is? Now these are pits uh, that you find in the High Cascade Mountains, and we got onto this pit business uh, way back uh, in 1967. A logger witnessed three of these animals walking around a squatting position on a rock slide smelling the rocks picking them up and smelling them and then finally the male found the right spot and he started digging and he threw rocks out of there that's one of those holes oh, you didn't see this though, no, I didn't see this okay, I went back and checked out several years later and, and took measurements and everything but I talked to the man who did and got well acquainted with him and he said those animals were just uh, very agile quiet and they didn't see him until they got through digging a hole and they came up with a nest of rodents uh, hibernating ground squirrels. This was late October. It was cold weather, freezing rain and snow, and they were hibernating. And they <coughs> ate they ate those rodents right on the spot. The, it was three animals: a but male Jim, and a female and an infant. So, and Jim, so what you have shown us in your belief is a Bigfoot habitat. Right. To your right, my left, Grover Krantz, again for our viewers, a professor of anthropology at Washington State University, author on this subject. What, tell our viewers, what has convinced you that, yes, there is a Bigfoot? Well, the first thing that uh, convinced me was um, back in 1970 when I saw and studied a pair of uh, footprint casts from uh, up in the northeastern uh, corner of Washington. And this is one we refer to now as cripple foot. The uh, right foot was badly crippled, and I tried to reconstruct the likely bone structure and at the time, I didn't think that was very likely real. But when I reconstructed it, I found out it was exactly the kind of design that would be necessary for an eight-foot-tall uh, creature with an otherwise human de uh, body design. And I figured nobody could have figured this out. Where'd you get these casts? I uh, just got them from one of the local citizens up there. And um, I didn't bring those particular ones here. Mm -hmm. Well, being uh, rather observant, I've noticed that you have a few things in front of you here. Uh, is anything here uh, evidence uh, of Bigfoot that I'm looking at here in this collection? Well, yes. This is a copy of a plaster cast that was made of a uh, uh, footprint when, um, well, we'll get to it later, uh, Roger Patterson got a movie of one back in 1967. This is one of the footprints that it left, 14 and a half inches long. Uh, this is, seems rather large, but that's a female. Here's another one for what we presume is an adult male, also from Northern California. That's 17 inches long, and that's an awful lot bigger than a human foot. As you that's a know. foot almost big enough that I'll be playing in the NBA. He should be, yeah, mm -hmm. <clears throat> something like that. But this is an actual cast that purports to have been made. Is that correct? Right. And and this, you say, it's the casts that have convinced you. Yes, not just that they are cast, but uh, in some of them I can see some details of anatomy that I figure nobody else could have plotted from nothing. And I see them in the footprints, and I figure if somebody faked those, he had to know more about human anatomy than I do, and a more inventive uh, uh, mind than mine, and I don't think there is anybody like that. Grover, what's the name? <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is the name of the famous videotape that our viewers are about to see? Okay, that's sometimes referred to as the Patterson-Gimlin film. The Patterson film. And I would like ask uh, staff there to please roll this, and if you would narrate for our viewers and tell us what are we about to see. What is this videotape? There's an animal walking through the forest. That's a slightly advanced speed. It was what really forest? Where? In north northwestern California, Bluff mm -hmm. Creek. Then we're going to see the same thing in slow motion. It actually moves a lot faster than this, but this gives you a little better uh, indication of the body size and the flowing movements. This creature uh, would stand uh, six feet, six inches tall. I was able to uh, figure that out with some precision from studying the film. It turned and looked at the cameraman for just a moment there. How, how'd this happen? <clears throat> who, who took this? There's a man named Roger Patterson, who's now dead, and a companion named Robert Gimlin, who will still assure you that the thing is real. 
Now, what are we seeing now? Now, this is a uh, stop frame. We go about five frames on uh, uh, each, uh, uh, that is, each film is uh, dupl duplicated five times, so it's an extremely slow motion. This is the way we uh, slow something down to study and uh, measure the anatomy, the stride, the bend of the knee, things like that. How's that different for me? Why, why wouldn't that be just a human in a suit? Well, for one thing, uh, six and a half feet tall is a little bit hard to match, but it's quite uh, reasonable. For another thing, the most difficult thing is the width of the shoulders. They're far too wide to be a human being. Uh, shoulder pads? Well, uh, shoulder pads will get the outside of the shoulders apart, but it can't get the width of the chest out to there. There's no way a human being would have um, arms that set that far apart. Okay, what else? Is that, that's it? That's it. All right, there we've heard. Now I'm going to turn to the other side of the aisle to our skeptics. And I'm gonna start with you, Caleb. Caleb Burns, clinical psychologist, uh, eyewitness testimony, videotape, casts. Uh, what's to say that no, there is no Bigfoot? I'm not sure that there's much to say that there is no Bigfoot, but it's important for the people, for the proponents, to realize that the ball is in their court. That is, if you, one advances extraordinary claims, one has got to come up with extraordinary proof for those claims. Well, they claims. would say that. They say, look, we have eyewitnesses. Here's a gentleman who stood 100 feet away. They say we've got a videotape. They say we've got casts. They say, what else do you want? These are wonderful witnesses. I'm sure that they're very sincere in what they have seen. My youngster is going to be visited by Santa Claus in a while, and he too may be convinced by the evidence before his eyes. Um, I, these are very nice bits of evidence as well, but I am, these do not compel belief in me. These are not done under good observational conditions. These, the, the evidence brought forward is uh, over many years, is hearsay in some cases, is um, but it, it, the explanation this gentleman had for a bear may, may be correct, and at least it, it appeared to him to be a bear too, perhaps a bear with a sore foot or other uh, descrip uh, descriptions of a bear. It's just that the evidence is not compelling. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. I'm going to ask you, Mike Dennett, since you're with the Society of Sensible Explanations, what is a sensible explanation for all that you've heard? Well, of course, we've had a lot of data thrown out at us. We've had eyewitness testimony. Correct. Okay, let's just take that for just a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one of the things that we try to do in our, uh, our group is to try to get data out to the general public, your viewers, uh, about this type of thing. And some of this, uh, this testimony that we heard can be very compelling, but what we have to understand is, is that there is a lot of eyewitness testimony for extraordinary things. For example, uh, Bigfoot is reported in the eastern part of the United States as often as it is in the western part. I'm talking about states like Michigan. And I'm not talking about one or two reports. I'm talking about hundreds of reports in a single year. I'm talking about New York, where there are Bigfoot sightings on Long Island, even Staten Island. And in Texas, there are Bigfoot reports. And then if we take other monsters, like the Loch Ness Monster, we find that there are many, many sightings of Loch Ness-type monsters in places like Lake Champlain, uh, up here in British Columbia. Uh, so we have a lot of monster sightings. We even have sightings of dinosaurs in the Republic of the Congo. So we have a lot of eyewitness uh, evidence that, we, that we, we get. What discounts that? Well, if we have all this data, and if in fact we have a thousand Bigfoot in the Northwest, then there should be objective data that we can analyze. And now Grover's talked about uh, some of his footprints. He has one underneath the table here, his famous uh, footprint from uh, <clears throat> the Blue Mountains that uh, he's convinced, I believe, uh, indicates that, there's, that this is evidence of Bigfoot. And so our group and myself in particular, I looked into some of the evidence behind this, this particular uh, set of footprints that were made in 1982 <clears throat> in the Blue Mountains. And one of the things I discovered early on is that the person who discovered these footprints had admitted to hoaxing big footprints previous to this. And then since then, that individual has uh, been involved in producing evidence from sites that are obviously also hoaxed Bigfoot. Yeah. How do I know that? Well, for example, he produced <coughs> some hair samples, alleged hair samples of Bigfoot, which turned out to be uh, artificial fibers, man-made fibers. So obviously that can't be uh, from a creature. Mike or Caleb, if you want to come in on this, tell me 
since you are a skeptic, then you're a skeptic, then you tell me if I say to you, wait a minute, I just saw it on a videotape. Explain that videotape to me. If you had to bet, that what is that videotape? How did that happen? Well, the Patterson film, uh, to me, looks like a person in a bear suit, but that's not what I want your viewers. They need to take a look at it and make their own assessment. In general, the, uh, the data indicates that the general public is not impressed by the Patterson film. There's less than 20% of the population that uh, thinks Bigfoot is uh, a reality. But Caleb, I'll ask you then, if you're going to sure. say, well, let them make their own assessment, uh, what can you say to help them make an assessment that would agree with yours? One is that, once again, is that in order to believe in something as extraordinary as Bigfoot and with the great numbers and the great size and so on, we require physical proof of such a thing. We may read about Elvis Presley all we want to in the, in the rags and so on, but to really believe that he's alive, I, I want to see the king perform. You know, I want to feel his sweat, and even then I want to make sure it's him. There is no Elvis Presley, as far as we know, that's walking around, although he's been sighted many, many times. Uh, th there just is no good proof that this exists. What about the videotape? Why isn't the videotape good proof? My kid loves Ninja Turtles. I, you know, my youngster, my five-year-old loves Ninja Turtles. Videotapes can be faked, can be altered. They can catch the different things and so on. It, it, they just lay themselves so open for misrepresentation and miss showing people things. All right, yeah, other scale, we, let's let, go, okay, go ahead, back to you. Well, Mike. we have some tremendous wildlife photographers in this country who are taking pictures all the time, and that's their living. They haven't produced any pictures of Bigfoot. The only people that produce pictures of Bigfoot are believers. Skeptics, any other skeptics, like a skeptics? You're a skeptic? Yeah. Identify yourself, please. Like us, we go high school, high mm -hmm. school teacher for many years. It's done a little bit of research, and I, I'm going to support the statement over here that that you have to have repeatability. And I think the, the statement about the hair is a good example. What's repeatability so, mean? Repeatability in science, of course, means that you perform experiments that has to be repeatable. Um, scientists or other people have to see. Uh, there was a <clears throat> one set of experiments that was done a number of years ago on paramecium, where if you play uh, music to paramecium, they'll reproduce better, faster. <laughs> Um, that went out, of course, because it would never be, in, the evidence just wasn't there, wasn't repeatable. And I, I see in myself uh, a lot of similarity to uh, the Loch Ness Monster situation and UFOs in here. It, it, it just doesn't seem to ever get back to get any real physical substance that one can really deal with. Skeptic, another skeptic I saw hand you, sir. Yeah, I'm Hal Weeks, I'm a biologist. And with increasing human use of remote er areas, whether it's for logging, for mining, hunting, fishing, recreation, one would think that encounters would be more and more frequent. We don't seem to be seeing that. And with human use of those same ecosystems, one would think that that would be stressing the population of these creatures, whatever they may be, perhaps forcing them into closer contact with humans over time. Again, that doesn't seem to be happening. So, again, I... I go along with the line that there really has not yet been any compelling evidence. I'm hopeful, but I'm not convinced. All right, a question we'll throw out when we come back, and yes or no on Bigfoot, but what harm? Is there any harm in believing in Bigfoot? We'll deal with that question when we come back right after this. Right, you may be saying maybe it is maybe it isn't big deal what's the harm so i'll put that to to those here who are probably most eminently qualified to discuss that uh would you introduce yourself please i'm elliot weiner psychologist here in portland elliot, is there any harm in believing this i really don't see what harm there is in believing it i think it unless you carry it to an extreme like almost anything i mean if you're using your kids food money to go out on bigfoot sightings i think then you've got to draw the line on it but you know i think it, uh, it's sort of that reasonable romantic side of life um, that, that sort of, there's plenty of time to be a cynic, so I don't think there's any harm in sort of just allowing that possibility to exist. I'd much rather have people spend all their energy in believing and searching for Bigfoot than for the OCA, basically. Well, let's see now if we can draw a contrast here. Back to you, Caleb Burns. What do you say? Is there any harm in believing? Well, uh, yes, I, I, I think there is some harm. I, I don't think anyone's going to kill themselves if they can't get a date with Bigfoot, for instance. But, 
But I, I do think that it can be harmful. It, it can be diverting for people. It can lead them astray. When Elliot says he, he's, he'd rather, my good friend Elliot says that he would rather people look for, 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 yeah, for Bigfoot rather than um, help with OCA and so on. People can get enmeshed in certain projects, and they can, it can be so enrapturing, so captivating, that they can, rather than simply spending their money, there, there are other problems with that, too. You can be diverted from studies, from uh, pursuits that one really should be involved in. You can learn illogical thinking as well, too. I, a real problem... What do you mean you can learn illogical thinking as well? Okay, a, a real problem is that this world is an incredibly complex place right now. We have huge problems with, I'll just pick on a couple, AIDS, ozone layer, overpopulation. These are huge problems. They require clear thinking. They require data, logical reasoning. I don't think Elliot would say that, that there's much reason to believe in Bigfoot. He would say that, that it maybe isn't terribly harmful to, to believe in Bigfoot. But what I'm saying is that it, that it is somewhat harmful and that there's no good reason for it and that if we encourage these sorts of belief, and uh, unfortunately I I consider them sort of a fringe belief in a way, um, but if, if we encourage illogical thinking, then we are ill-equipping our youngsters, and it's terrific that we have kids here tonight, uh, young students here tonight. It, uh, we're going to encourage them, I think, to, to think illogically with no good data. The world is too complicated, too dangerous a place now for that. Mr. Spock, wait a second. Whoa. <laughs> you, you, you know, you have to allow for the romance, for the, for the faith, for, for, for what people want to put themselves in. You can't just say, you know, that doesn't compute, it's not logical. We don't function like computers. And, and it's only when you get on overload do I agree that the concern is there? But I don't hear our, but Elliot, I don't hear our you know, friends across the aisle talking about, Elliot. you know, that they're spending all their money and they're out there uh, doing a lot Elliot. of logical thinking. I trust that uh, I'll drive behind them on the freeway. I, I think they're probably right. Elliot, you spoke about evolution of thinking as, as a stage that people go through. And if it is, I think good. But I don't think that we want to encourage it as a stage that would hang up people um, in sort of illogical thinking. And I, I, I agree with you once again. Uh, as, as a belief goes, there are a lot worse beliefs than Bigfoot. I believe in the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus and so on to a certain extent. Yeah, come see me later. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'll talk to you about that one. But, but I, I do want people to evolve through belief in Bigfoot into yeah, something else. I'm going to evolve uh, from that into uh, some questions to others. Here's a gentleman here whose uh, vocation uh, puts him out there where this, uh, his vocation might cross with an interest. Would you tell our viewers who you are? Well, I'm paid to be a skeptic, Jack. I'm mm -hmm. Grant McComey. I'm with uh, KTU Television right here, the outdoor reporter. I spent a great deal of time exploring the western outdoors. Okay, that's why I put it to you. You're out, you, you just said it. A great deal of time. Have you ever seen Bigfoot? No, sir, I have not. No, I have not. I've not heard him either. But there are people, and we've heard it tonight, who are very convinced that what they have seen and what they have heard exists. We've got one way in the back row. The gentleman in the back there, you, sir. You, sir, you not only saw Bigfoot, but you brought us something here to demonstrate what Bigfoot looks like. And if we could have this brought up here for our viewers, where are we? Oh, I see. It's a little tough to see right here in the dark. That's how it hides. What, what is that, That's sir, right hide. back yeah. there? <laughs> what? what? That's the way I approach him. This means no fight. That means no fight? Pick a... Well, I'm, I'm going to definitely do that. That means no fight. <laughs> Pick a you, saw a big foot? you saw Bigfoot? You saw Bigfoot? Thirteen times. Thirteen times? Thirteen times. And what is that we're looking at? That? Who made that? That one I made after I saw one on a Quinell River, and I was in a canoe going up river, and she was standing on a river bank looking me over. I pulled over within 20 feet of her and sat there and looked her over for 20 minutes. I had no camera. She made no move at me. I just pulled away and went on up the river. And so there, and there's the model. That's, that's, now, uh, I, we take this back I to you. What do you say to that now? This gentleman that. has made 13 sightings, and you're in the woods all the time. You haven't made one. Aren't you paying attention? <laughs> <What's> <laughs> <it>? <laughs> huh? Sometimes you're so focused on catching that fish. You know. <laughs> Some people are just luckier than others when it comes to this. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been spending a lot of time talking with people who are skeptics, people who are very convinced in the reality. And uh, it comes down to a lot of luck, I think. A lot of luck. And you haven't had the luck? I just haven't had it. No, I have not. And th there's, there's more than uh, contemporary sightings here. There's a tradition. You, sir, would you identify yourself? My name is Ed Edmund. I'm Shoshone Bannock. And many tribes in the Northwest have had a history of legends about these hairy creatures. Uh, when white people first got here, the Bella Coola had stories of large ape-like creatures. Um, they've been sighted by Indians and we went up to 20 years ago. A friend of mine saw them, went up at Mount, Mount uh, Hood. She was going to Warm Springs and she had 
flat tire and the creature came and shook the car and woke him up. They were cold, lucky woke him up. Then they, they got the car going, luckily. My father saw tracks in 1949 on the north side of the uh, Rishram train bridge. And the people on the railroad told him not to tell anyone because they didn't want to cause a big uproar. But he saw actual footprints of Bigfoot. So it's ingrained in our, in our, in our storytelling and sightings. Mike Dennett, what do you say to the <coughs> possibility that sometimes legend reflects truth? Oh, there's probably a lot of truth to that, but it's so interpreting, saying, interpreting yeah. the legend is very difficult. And if, if you've already believed that there's a Bigfoot there, you can take, I would think, any tribe that has a good oral history and find a legend of Bigfoot in there or, or of a river monster. We also have a history here, though, of uh, European settlement of this area and, of course, uh, eastern uh, the United States, too. And we find virtually no history to Bigfoot before 1920 or 1930. And that certainly is unlikely if there is a physical creature out there. But if, as we would suggest, uh, Bigfoot is a manifestation of, of the human uh, characteristic to, to, to produce uh, monsters, uh, that it is likely that Bigfoot would be found throughout the United States and throughout a particular period in history. Yes, sir. Right there. Hey, Jack. I'm Warren Haig. I'm a believer. I just have a question for the skeptic. Uh, if we are to uh, believe that there is some harm to believing and also uh, that we have to have absolute evidence at all times to believe, then that's like saying we're wasting our money on the space program because we are not out there. All we have is videotape of the golf ball being hit on the moon. All we have is videotape of the various probes going out. We are not out there. So are we saying that uh, we're wasting our time and our money and believing falsely in our space program? The space program works. It's a wonderful adventure, and it has pr had many payoffs. Even for Oregon now, we have a computer industry based on what came out of the early transistor technology. We haven't, seen, we haven't seen any aliens, Could I, I suppose. Legend to uh, science. Go ahead. Would you identify uh, yourself? Uh, Carlos Pazito, I, th I think I've been involved with Bigfoot for about 30 years, Did and really? uh, I've had sighting uh, experience. Um, I got a call uh, from, and for you who are, you know, need to know titles, this guy is a, a doctorate in forestry and then a geologist friend. They found a nest down in uh, southeastern, or, southwestern Oregon. How did they find a nest? Well, these guys are trained a little bit later in life, and they have a sense that these things are possible. They've, they've also heard the stories. Uh, I was called, uh, uh, Krantz was called. Uh, I asked them not to have Krantz come and to examine it because he may take it uh, w with a gun. And um, uh, I got down to the siding area, and we examined the siding area. Uh, uh, we saw the manufacture of the nest. We saw large limbs on the bottom. We saw ferns that were picked and put on the top. This was an active nest. You, you photographed that? We, we photographed it. But the thing that's important is that there are forensics capacities that are able to identify. Now, what's, what do you mean by now, that? Now, a forensic uh, a capacity to identify individually. For example, we all, most of all of us have uh, a social security numbers. In the business of forensics, if you can identify uh, an individual, uh, 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 the, the DNA, for example, if you can identify the person's DNA and exclude other, other people's DNA, you can convict that individual. Mm -hmm. These we, same have processes. Have we picked up anything with DNA these, on these, these same processes question, have yeah. been used uh, to identify. In 1988, I was reading a forensics uh, science, uh, journal of science, mm -hmm. and in there, there was a there was a team. This pro this process was not active in, in this. It mm -hmm. hadn't Could come you to conclude. We're time. Yeah. Okay. Campus fugitive. Uh, mm -hmm. We we got a positive fine uh, by a European team that for that for that, that, that that does the carotenes that electri le electrically phoreses the carotenes, we got a primate out of that, non-human primate. Um, Caleb? Th you know, there's, th there's the old story about the, the Greek fellow who was bragging to his, his friend. He said, when I was on roads, I jumped 15 feet. And he said, boy, I was a really good jumper. And he kept saying about how he could jump on roads. And his friend finally said, this is roads. Let's see how far one can jump here. One of the things about a nice controlled study, replicable study, as this gentleman says, and teachers are my heroes, especially science teachers, that this, this gentleman says is that it's got to be replicable. We have to 
find it repeating itself under controlled conditions and under conditions that a skeptic or non-believer can yeah, see. You're not reading the material what, available. Can, okay. Excuse me. He's got, what, uh, then what to you would be convincing? What to you would be? You said there's got to be more convincing evidence. What would that amount to? Well, one of the things that I believe in are dinosaurs. And my youngster, once again, is crazy about dinosaurs. There's, uh, there's a lot of evidence for dinosaurs, <laughs> just to pick on uh, fossil plants and, and a lot of a lot of animals, plants, and, and other organisms have come here before. There's an exciting discovery now, or about five years ago, eight years ago, the bottom of the ocean floor with plants that are living somewhere where no one had thought they would live before. These volcanic vents, just marvelous things. I would want real live sightings, if, if you're looking at the range of evidence, under controlled conditions. I would, some what bones, are controlled conditions? Controlled conditions would be replicable conditions, clear sightings, evidence that could not be changed, altered, duped, and so on. Unique, uh, well, not unique, but e evidence that, that occurs under controlled conditions by people that are good about determining fakery and, and that know about... Uh, you mean maybe like skeptics so coming up with a sure. proof rather than people who are believers Well, or independent with. third parties like the wildlife photographers that I mentioned earlier. All the pictures we have of Bigfoot are fuzzy photographs. I mean, even the Patterson film is very grainy and fuzzy. I mean, where are, where are the, the type of photography? If you had a picture that we've seen here tonight, if you were going to show that on National Geographic, I mean, they'd laugh you, you off, uh, off of their program. I mean, they have to have quality uh, photographs of Bengal tigers or whatever else they're, they're doing a show on. That's what we need. But if the yeah. Bigfoot is really out there, Jack, where's the roadkill? I mean, exactly. every other creature gets hit by cars. And, the, uh, <laughs> and, and the most of the sightings are along yeah, roads. Grover, back to you. Grover, yeah. I have just a quick question for you before we get out of here. Grover, how are, from your viewpoint, how are we ever going to resolve this controversy? I'll give you the same answer that every biologist will give me, and I will agree with you people here. You need a body. What Nothing. does that mean? A dead body or skeletal material, nothing else is completely convincing. Are you saying then telling the people out in the woods shoot to kill? If, that, if you can't find a dead one on its own, yes. yes. And that's, shoot a, to kill. that's an right. irresponsible says, position. Uh, shoot to kill is his advice to resolve the controversy. Is that good sense? We'll find out when we come back right after this. I asked how to resolve it. One of the believers says we need a body. Back to you then, Grover Krantz. Yeah. You say we need a body. Are you, would you be advocating that if someone sees this Bigfoot, like a hunter who sees a Bigfoot, that they shoot the Bigfoot? Well, hopefully it's a hunter who knows what he's shooting at and he knows how to bring it down. Uh, yes, that should be done. Why? Why, why do you advocate that? They did that, that to us Indians okay. for 500 years. Huh? Right. Let, let him finish. It didn't work. Let him finish. Didn't why? <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> Please let him finish. Why? The only point in shooting one, and only one, absolutely, is to prove that they exist and to end a controversy. What the second mean? step... Don't only shoot one the second step... Please, please, let's see. Yeah, let's, one, just seconds, all of these is two at a time. It is possible <laughs> that this is an endangered species, and we are doing something that will ultimately lead to their destruction. If we find out that they are real and we find out what they need, we may correct the situation. This will not be done until they're proven to be real. No government will take any action without the proof. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you prove they exist, we might save them. If we don't prove yeah, they you, exist, we're risking yeah, it. I'm going to take that to you, sir. Uh, please identify yourself. I'm Peter no, right Watts. There. No, right here. Right here in front. Uh, I'm Dave Sidden from the Washington Park Zoo. And, I'm going to uh, ask you how you react to that. <laughs> well, we wouldn't advocate in shooting anything that could be potentially a highly endangered species like this. If there is a genetically viable population out there, there'd have to be a population of somewhere near 1,000 to sustain uh, good DNA or good uh, genetic makeup here in the Pacific Northwest. So we would think that uh, advocating shooting that you're setting up for people hiking in the woods to get blown away or anything else. And then if there is the genetic uh, makeup out there, it may be critical that every individual is saved. So um, we w would be very uh, apprehensive about anybody shooting a Tasmanian tiger or the California condor or any of those animals. We could potentially wipe out the species. Right behind you. Yeah, I saw a film today called Legend of Bigfoot, and they shot the Bigfoot twice in this film, and it got up and ran up a hill. So, you know, 
if you shoot it, it's not going to stay down, I don't think. That's, 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 that's yeah. All right, you, sir. Uh, Bill Merrill from Tigard, and I'm going to say something that is different from anything else in this room, okay? We will not find evidence, it is my belief, of Bigfoot, although we will see Bigfoot from time to time. At this precise point in the universe, there are three or four other Earths functioning at different energy frequencies or dimensions. Bigfoot lives in one of those dimensions. It is a nonviolent form of life. It eats plant food, but it does have enemies. Several of the enemies are quite larger than Bigfoot, and then there's little packs like wild dogs. When Bigfoot encounters them, Bigfoot has the capability of changing the energy frequency of its body form. Sometimes, it's like having a real stat here and dialing. Sometimes he ends up here in planet Earth. And he's here, stabilizes for a short period of time, and then what occurs is he dials himself back and goes back to his other frequency. This is an explanation of why everybody says they see him, but <coughs> no, uh, these people over here are saying they never. Uh, there is no evidence. Skeptics on the wrong frequency, young man. <laughs> there. Um, I wonder if someone actually. Identify killed... yourself, please. Okay, I'm a Lake Oswego student, and um, <laughs> without a name. <laughs> and, uh, I'm Peter Watts, and I okay. wonder if someone actually killed one, and it was in these dimensions. Would it just disappear after it died, or would it stay there? Um, that, that, that is the word that we had. If yeah. one died here, they would also move it back to its own frequency. Right there, back to the teacher. Yeah, Jack, I wanted to point out that, you know, in 1939, the, the coelacanth studies, these fish, we had evidence in the rocks and all that that fish existed at one time, and, and everybody thought it was gone. But uh, in 1939, a fisherman happened to catch one off the coast of Africa. Um, didn't know what he got, but he saved it, and they stuffed it. They got it to the to the biologists, and since that time, they have found the home of this coelacanth, which is not gone at all. I'm saying, being a skeptic in science, just uh, just we just always work from that point of view, and uh, and that's the way it needs to be, I think, because you have to have controls, you have to have evidence. Time running down. When we come back, we'll put the heat on the hot seats. Right after this. All right, as promised, we get near the end by putting the heat on the hot seat. And first, I'm going to come to you, Caleb Burns, and I'm going to say to you, Caleb, we've heard these explanations, and there are people here who'd like to give you more. Eyewitness accounts, very clear. How can you explain that? We've heard direct observation. How can you tell our viewers to disbelieve that? The appropriate response for science, and this gentleman said it absolutely correctly, is one of disbelief, skepticism, until a proof has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt to, 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 the, to the point where we know it's true, the scientific approach is to disbelieve. Once again, the people... Well, why should the common person after viewing this, why should they disbelieve what they've heard tonight from purported eyewitness accounts? Why should they disbelieve Let's say that? I have a cure for you. Let's say you have some dread malady, and I say, in this bottle is a medicine that is really going to help you. And you say, no, I don't believe you. And you say, well, yes, take my word for it. If, if you use this medicine, you're going to be cured of some terrible disease. Shouldn't you say, where is your proof for that? I want to see the documentation. Don't we ask people to ask for that documentation? There is clear labeling of, of produce and stores and so on. And we are assured that, indeed, the ingredients on the package max, match what's inside the package. Grover, the question for you in the hot seat is this. Cameras all over the world, sightings all over the world. A dam re breaks in remote Idaho, clear pictures of it. A plane falls in the sky in San Diego, clear pictures. Why haven't we yet seen the really clear pictures? Why shouldn't there be maybe a couple of dozen clear pictures as clear as the sightings that have been reported? The animal's nocturnal. It's very rare. Most people who see it are so stunned they don't know what to do. Very few people have the presence of mind to use a camera even if they've got it. And even if they did get good clear pictures, the scientific world would still not believe it. All right, want uh, more information out there on Bigfoot? We'll tell you how you can get some more information and participate in this controversy when we come back right after this. Over. 
Good evening, I'm Steve Dunn. Here's a look at some of the stories we're following tonight in Channel 2 Newsroom. We'll get reaction from Washington, D.C. regarding allegations facing Senator Bob Packwood. He's accused of making unwanted sexual advances towards several women during his 24-year career. We'll have a full report tonight. We'll also hear from Washington's Patty Murray, one of Capitol Hill's newest female senators, regarding the Packwood allegations. And Blazer Piston highlights from the Coliseum. All today's new sports and weather at 11 o'clock. All right. I have about one minute here, which I'm going to divide up 30 seconds to a believer who hasn't spoken. Here is it, 30 seconds. Believer hasn't spoken. Right there, you, sir. you got 30 Hi, seconds. Fire away. My name Fire is Chuck Larock, and I live in Portland. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe uh, one time when I was in the, about 85, I was in the Ho Rain Forest, which is like an enchanted forest. And I was by myself in a tent, and two of my friends had left for a night walk. And uh, while, while I was there, I heard these footsteps, and I thought they were coming back. And it leaned against the, the tent and felt me. My, my body, then it walked around to the front. You saw it? And I was so dark, but I, I just knew it how was there. How tall? I didn't, I couldn't tell how tall, because it was so dark. I didn't have, they had the flashlight. 30 seconds for a skeptic who hasn't spoken. A skeptic, you, sir, who hasn't spoken. Yeah, I believe that um, people want to believe. I think we all have a need to, um, it's, it's called a missing link, and I think we all want to have a link to the past. I definitely deplore people don't go out and shoot it, because maybe something like that did exist, and we'd probably destroyed more species than exists now on the face of the earth from such activity. As far as finding DNA, things like that, people keep coyotes and wolves and chimpanzees and something like that could have gotten away and they found some primate DNA. You do need hard evidence, but you don't go out there blowing away the woods. A continuing investigation here, Grant McComey. Uh, tell us what, uh, what you have planned here for more information. Well, as I mentioned to you earlier, I spent a couple of weeks looking at this issue, and what we've come up with are a couple of stories Monday and Tuesday during our 11 o'clock news where we try to maybe separate some of the fact from fantasy, discern some of the legend, folklore, some of the basis perhaps, and take a look at this very important question that obviously stirs up an awful lot of uh, heat. And what do, you think, what do you think the viewers are going to conclude when they see that? Well, I, I'll tell you what I'm beginning to conclude. There are possibilities. There are always possibilities. All right, let's go right there. Right there, ma'am. Uh, no, ma'am, right there. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank Fire away. You. I'm Darla Gillespie, and I live in Portland. I am a firm believer in the Bigfoot, and uh, I may have had an experience with him. I knew I spotted him, but maybe I had an experience with him through his smell. But I would never disclose where I saw him. I would never do that because I want to live freely and protected and without harm. Skeptic, 30 seconds, young man. My name is George Chisno. I'm a student at Lake Oswego High School. Um, I think it's, um, it's pretty sad what these people think. I mean, it's like it goes back to this childhood fantasy. I read comic books. I read Superman. But there comes a point where you just really have to grow up and you have to say, what does science say? What is proven evidence is there? And then how much of this am I bringing out of my own mind, out of my own desire to create something? Well, there we go. Once again, we see sometimes what we have here, eyewitness reports, science, the debate goes back and forth. Where does it end up? I think there's maybe just one thing tonight that the people would agree on, and that is this, although maybe you'd call it a bit of a tentative agreement, and that is whether you believe or whether you don't, there's no great harm in it as long as you don't get too carried away with it so that you don't do other things in your life. Thank you for tuning into Town Hall, and good night. Meet your favorite columnists, including Dave Barry, Margie Boulay, and Jonathan Nicholas, next week on Town Hall.